Hey film fans, so can a movie be about punk? A punk film aesthetically, artistically, in terms of production and so on. And also at the same time, critical of punk? Let's find out in the first entry in this new series I'm doing on punk cinema. If you want to hear more about why I'm doing this and some of my kind of contextual thoughts about it, you can check out the introduction to the series right here. But let's get started talking about the 1978 film Jubilee on this episode of What Makes This Film Great. <laughs> Jubilee is a 1978 film that was directed by Derek Jarman, and it has a script by Derek Jarman and Christopher Hobbs. Hobbs is an interesting figure in Jarman's career. They collaborated on more than one occasion. Hobbs is a musician, a composer, but on Jubilee, he was the co-screenwriter and also one of the production designers. And I think that's interesting because part of what you get in this film and part of what you get in, in Jarman's career is a sense of people coming together to do what's necessary to get the film made. So there's a spirit of, I guess you could say, collaboration there that, you know, if you've watched any of my other videos, I harp on about the filmmaking process in general, but also I think it's kind of um, integral to the spirit of punk. Jarman is a director about whom I can't say enough in this video. He's one of the most uh, influential, consequential, visual stylists from the UK, perhaps globally, in the last 50 years. He was a filmmaker, he was a production designer, he worked on some of the early 70s films of Ken Russell. He made short films, he made narrative films, he made non-narrative films, he made experimental films, he made costume dramas, he made contemporary dramas, he, he wrote novels, he designed his home and gardens, and he was also a gay rights activist whose political spirit, whose... Um, dedication to gay rights, whose anger about the state of Margaret Thatcher's uh, Britain and, and the relegation of the legal sort of limitations on gay life there um, infuriated him, as did the AIDS crisis and the ineptitude or ignorance of American, British, and other governments. So this is a person who in a lot of ways embodies so much of what we mean when we call someone an artist. And he was also a man of contradictions, a person of contradictions, and that comes out in Jubilee. And, and you know, I'm not a German scholar, and if some of you are, or, or big German fans, feel free to elaborate in the comments, but he was a person who was at once both like radically modern in terms of his filmmaking, in terms of his outspokenness as an artist at a time when gay artists were not as outspoken or couldn't be as outspoken as they, they maybe can be today. But he was also in a way, and you see this in Jubilee, a kind of a traditionalist and British artistic figures outside of filmmaking as well have, have kind of flirted with uh, a pastoral nostalgia that t to today's eyes can come across as conservative or definitely at the minimum traditionalist. And I think you can go back as far as someone like William Blake, but also like in some of the late 60s and early 70s work of Ray Davies and the Kinks, sort of celebrating the village green and a, a kind of an older Britain that's gone now because of commercialism and crass capitalism and so on. So, I mean, German's not alone in trying to kind of find, you know, walk that line between very contemporary, modern, um, politically astute, lefty, but also hearkening back to a time when maybe things were better, which, you know, after 50 years of post-colonial studies, 50 years or more of 
definitely more, of class studies and so on, <laughs> and others, race, LGBT, uh, queer studies, uh, women's rights, women's studies, and so on. We can look back at a kind of pre-modern England and realize, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but let's just keep that in mind as we talk a little bit about Jubilee. Just a quick word about a couple of the other crew members. Peter, Peter Middleton does fantastic cinematography. I'll talk a little bit about it in this video. Nick Barnard and Tom Priestley are the editors and they lend the film some of its kind of disjointed and chaotic feel. The film's often described as episodic and sometimes even non-linear. I don't necessarily think that's quite accurate. It is episodic, but the episodes have a linearity to them. But the film eschews a lot of exposition and it eschews a lot of the kind of connective tissue that we tend to rely on today for film narratives. So an episode happens and then another episode happens and the film might not offer a connection between the two immediately. Like here's A and then therefore because of these circumstances here's B. We just get A and then we get B. <laughs> and then you have to piece it together but the film doesn't it's not sort of esoteric it's not an enigma it's it's pretty easy to follow throughout but part of why that works is because the editing by barnard and Priestley is very effective also i should mention that there is a sort of ambient score by brian eno and it doesn't show up a lot the film has a lot of punk music but whenever you hear that kind of Eno-esque score. It is. It's Brian Eno. Um, so that's just some of the talent involved in the film. For those of you who are punkers, punk music fans, um, musical kind of historians, or, you know, music fans who care a lot about the history of music as well, Jubilee is a film you have to watch. You might come away from it not having liked it, and we'll talk about why that might be. Um, you might find it a little slow or boring. Um, you might not love the film or what it has to say. But as a snapshot of an era, it's it's a kind of necessary text to engage with. And that is for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is because of the cast. One of the things to know about Jarman when you're engaging with Jubilee is that he lived amongst the punkers in mid late 70s london he lived in a squat in london he knew these people he was friends with them he wasn't necessarily a punk rocker but his work especially his 70s work is kind of um, imbued with the spirit of that era the punk spirit because he was associating with them he was moving in those circles he knew these people um, and he gets them in the film and so there's a ton of 1970s British punk faces, including some really influential people who weren't necessarily punk musicians, but who were part of the scene and influenced its look, its message, and so on. So you have, first of all, Jordan, who plays Amyl Nitrate, whose look, her appearance is, is like massively influential on the look of 70s British punk. You have Toya Wilcox, you have Adam Ant, and a host of other punk rockers. You have a couple people from the Rocky Horror Picture Show, Richard O'Brien, Little Nell, and then you have some mainstream, or what would become mainstream actors early in their career, like Ian Charlson, who many people will know from Chariots of Fire, which was a big Academy Award winner just a few years later. Most of these people were part of the scene, and Jarman recruited them because of that. So when you're looking at Amyl Nitrate, that's Jordan. Jordan is one of the people who kind of developed and helped design the British punk look. And so when you watch Jubilee, part of what you're seeing is the actual scene. They're playing versions of themselves. They're playing fictional characters. Their names are all different, but you're seeing the punk scene of 1977 Britain when it was filmed on screen. Um, and just for that alone, it's worth watching. Coupled with that is that Jarman films parts of London that <laughs> to me, I didn't live in London in the 70s. I didn't visit London until, 
1991, I think. Um, at which time it was kind of, it was still kind of gritty, but it was in the process of this sort of two decade long and continuing today gentrification. Um, but in the 70s, London was still in a kind of um, recovery from the war. It had had moments of economic prosperity, swinging London and all that, but it wasn't sort of 50 years of getting over the war and improvement. And so there were still parts of the city, there were still buildings that hadn't been repaired. This might sound strange to an audience today. First of all, consider that it's only 30 years after the end of the war. Um, but it's expensive. I lived in Budapest in Hungary in the early 2000s and there were still buildings then, there's probably still some today, but there were still buildings then that had been shelled by Soviet tanks in 1956 that hadn't been repaired. Today if you go to Budapest and go into the New York cafe, it's got golden ceilings and it's amazing and you feel very opulent and turn of the century, last turn of the last century. <laughs> Most of the time when I lived there it had this kind of ancient wooden scaffolding on the outside. If you looked through the windows there was uh, plaster all over the place, furniture overturned and so on. And that was because it had been shelled in, in 56 and it had fallen into decrepitude and it was still that way 50 years later. So this is not outrageous. but. Jarman captures that aspect of London and that aspect of London, you see it a little bit if you watch this new Danny Boyle series, uh, Pistol, about this era, but that's production design, <laughs> location scouting. This is the London that the punks of 70s Britain were responding to. This is that feeling when you listen to Susie and the Banshees and the Sex Pistols and the Damned and so on, that you get that there are parts of the city that have been forgotten. And that's a big driving factor in punk music, the sense that these, these kids, these young adults have been forgotten, have been looked over, passed over, so on. And so when you watch Jubilee, again, just like the historical record of seeing people like Jordan on screen, you're seeing that London on screen. So for that alone, this is a very kind of necessary text in the history of punk and in the history of punk cinema. Is it a great film? It's an important film. It's an interesting film. Is it a great film? It's hard to say. It's definitely provocative, but also thought provoking. I'll try to quickly sort of outline the plot, but part of what makes the film work so well is these episodes that I mentioned and the way each of them almost takes on its own tone. So as you're watching the film develop, the characters change a little bit based on which characters are in an episode or in a scene, how they interact with each other, how they've interacted with each other in previous scenes, and how they interact with new characters coming in and going out. So they change in a way to fit the scene, even as the main characters maintain a very sort of recognizable narrative and character through line throughout the film. But that's what gives it a lot of its complexity, is that you might see Bod acting one way earlier in the film or another way later in the film. Certainly Amyl Nitrate, you see her acting one way earlier. She starts to change in the middle. She changes more in the end, but while still maintaining some of who she is early in the film. And th those sort of changes, you know, it's kind of like when you take two or three um, elements or two or three, whatever it might be, and sort of bang them up together. If I bang these two things, you get one reaction, but if I bang these two things, you get another reaction. And, and it works in that way. And then so, I mean, I think, and then so ideas about punk, ideas that are punk adjacent come out in different ways. And this is what gives the film, I, can, I don't know, it's complexity, it's layers. Some of which are hard to take, some of which are not comfortable, and some of which are highly critical of punk. So let's just talk a little bit about, if I can, <laughs> what happens in Jubilee. First of all, it's called Jubilee because it's part of the whole Queen Elizabeth uh, the second 50-year Jubilee, you know, and it's the same um, event 
that led the Sex Pistols to go down the Thames singing God Save the Queen during the Jubilee celebrations. There are two stories, one which is more of a framing device, but a very important framing device, and one which is kind of the main narrative. The framing device is set in late 16th century um, England, and we have Queen Elizabeth I, played by Junie Reneker, and John Dee, played by Richard O'Brien from um, Rocky Horror Picture Show, and Helen Weddington Lloyd, who plays the, the lady-in-waiting of Elizabeth. And they're conducting a, a, a um, occult experiment. John Dee was a real person. He was an advisor to, to Queen Elizabeth, and he was interested in the occult and alchemy and things like that. And they call forth the angel Ariel. His next film, I think German's next film, or soon after would be his version of Shakespeare's The Tempest, a very well-received sort of modern at the time take on The Tempest, which you should check out, in which Ariel is the kind of spirit of the island, a great, great character. Um, anyhow, Ariel comes forth and says, oh, what do you wish? And Elizabeth says, I want knowledge. I want to know. I want my brain full. And he's like, okay, you want knowledge? I'm going to show you 1977 Britain. And um, when he first shows it to them, it's almost like they're watching it on a TV. They, they're in her castle or her palace, and they're all looking ahead like this. But the way it's shot, it looks like they're watching TV, which I think is intentional, but it's interesting. Eventually, they will end up somehow through the magic of the angel Ariel in Britain, but they're almost like observers and non-participants. They, they kind of float through the film in a kind of Greek chorus way to comment on the action of the main narrative. And then the film ends with them and their decision to return home and kind of leave this Britain behind. So that's the framing device. And then the main story is about this kind of collective flat squat of punk women. And these women sort of live together. They teach each other things. The first, one of the first scenes we get of them is um, a kind of educational class where Amel Nitrate, who seems to be one of the newest members, is talking to a sort of seminar of punk women about British history. Um, her version of. <laughs> and these are, they're clearly punk in their, in their appearance, but also in their outlook. But one of the interesting things that the film does is it kind of endows each of the main women with a certain sort of revolutionary characteristic. And those characteristics kind of stay with them throughout the film, even as they change in some scenes, as I said earlier, based on who they're interacting with and so on. So Jordan's ML Nitrate is a punk historian and she has this journal in which she's rewriting the history of Britain and she's doing it in a way because she she's getting rid of the boring bits in a way when I'm not making history I write it mad who's played by Toya Wilcox who shows up in other German films she hates this project she believes history is just to be forgotten um, and mad is another sort of type and Mad is, she's a fascinating and very difficult character for me. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, because she is the full spirit of tear it all down. Um, get pissed, destroy, as the Sex Pistols would say. She has, or exhibits anyway, no regard for convention, for authority, for um, manners, for rules. Mad is just about mad. And, and there's deep, deep well of anger in her. And she's hard for me to watch because I've met people like this. And she in, embodies the kind of destructive revolutionary spirit. And if there's going to be a revolution, <laughs> there needs to be some of that. But part of what this film is about is like, how much do you let the destructive revolutionary spirit become the dominant spirit of the revolution? Because, um, if we destroy everything, what's going to be in its place? Mad doesn't seem concerned with that, which is one of the reasons why she gets so upset with Amyl Nitrate's history lessons, because 
history doesn't matter. She's very hard to watch. One of the first times we see her is when they're all hanging out in this cafe and she's just taking postcards off a rack and burning them and, and the, the cafe waitress is just like, <laughs> please don't mess with me, and they mess with her hard. It's a very difficult scene to watch, and, and Mad kind of pushes this destructive anger into the group. Little Nell, who was also in Rocky Horror Picture Show, plays Krabs, and Krabs is the sexually liberated one of the group. She seems to care less for most of the film about the sort of, you know, ideology of punk, the politics of punk, the revolutionary, you know, the political revolutionary aspect, but she cares very much about her sexual liberation. And she talks about sex all the time. She has sex a lot on screen and just so you know, there's a lot of sex and there's a lot of nudity. Uh, and she has sex while her friends are watching. She doesn't care. Um, she'll have sex with the enemy. There's a scene late in the film when a couple of police officers are responsible for murdering some of the boys of the group and the gang decides that they're going to get revenge but Krabs decides she's going to sleep with one of the cops first. <laughs> um, and she's, she's often lounging about in her underwear and bra or she's nude and she's just lighthearted. She's actually a very a sort of breath of fresh air to watch on the screen when there's so much more sort of um, pointed kind of anger going on. So she, she sort of counterposes that in a way, but she's also, because of her life, lighthearted nature, willing to kind of go along with everything else. There are uh, a couple other women who are part of the group who don't get a lot of screen time, but they're interesting figures. There's Viv, who's played by Linda Spurrier. She's an artist. She seems throughout the film, just for the most part, just to be like, well, there's a squat here and they let me do my art. So I'm down with it. Um, her interesting role is that she is in a relationship with Angel and Sphinx, and they are brothers, <laughs> but also lovers. And Viv is their third. And they're two of the men who are murdered by the police later, and it's Viv who has to break this news to the rest of the, the gang. Then there's Chaos, played by Hermine de Moriane. She's a French actor. And she kind of, she's described as their French au pair. She sort of seems to be like a maid in a way. She doesn't do a lot in the film, except at the end she gets this really nice uh, scene when she tightrope walks across a laundry line. Um, but finally there is Bod, and Bod is played by Jenny Reneker, who also plays Queen Elizabeth I. And Bod is, well, I think she's kind of a psychopath. Um, She's very attractive, she's very aloof, she's very sort of um, above it all in a way, but it's Bod's spirit that is pushing um, the murderous intent that the group develops over the course of the film. And it's Bod's relationship with the character, the impresario, that leads to this sort of really kind of nihilistic... Um, cynical ending of the film uh, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. So these women are all living together in a time where um, punk seems to be everywhere. Um, the, the punk aesthetic, the punk look, the punk kind of uh, music is everywhere. It's on TV all the time. They're always watching punk music. Everyone knows all the punkers by name um, and it seems to be that that's kind of taking over England um, which is the beginning of some of Jarman's critique here. And the queen is dead, Elizabeth II. She's actually been murdered in a very interesting scene early in the film by Bod. And Bod shows up and it's hard to tell exactly that it's the queen who she's killing, but then she shows up with the authentic crown of Elizabeth and explains that she got it off her at a, a holiday home in Dorset. And, <laughs> So the world is, has, has kind of fallen into chaos without this leader. Um, this is a kind of a weird storyline, I think, for a punk film where, um, you know, the Sex Pistols are singing God Save the Queen, her fascist regime, she made you a moron and all this sort of stuff. But Jarman's film is saying something along the lines that without the institution, at least, of the monarchy, 
the UK might descend into chaos. The contradictions I talk about in the introduction uh, are rife in this film. And in this state rises the impresario. Without me, they don't exist. <laughs> the impresario Borgia Gins is played by Orlando and Orlando who was born Jack Burkett is a famous infamous well-known British um, performer a mime a theatrical performer who again ended up working with Jarman a lot and here he plays Borgia Gins this impresario and Gins is a hyper-capitalist and Gins has realized that in its current state, in all this chaos, he can make a ton of money in real estate. And the film doesn't go into all the details of this, but we know early in the film that he's been buying, <laughs> I think this is funny and I love this part of the film, buying up uh, car parks or parking lots and it's hugely profitable and the people who make money off it are highly invested in not pedestrianizing cities but that's a rant for a whole other video but Gins is one of these people um, and he's sort of kind of pervade that money from his car parks into um, bigger real estate like Westminster Abbey and Buckingham Palace and he sees punk, punk music, punk fashion, um, punk ideology as a vehicle for making money. This is the generation who grew up and forgot to lead their lives. They were so busy watching my endless movie. <laughs> it's power, babe. Power. I don't create it. I own it. I sucked and sucked and I sucked. The media became their only reality and I owned their world of flickering shadows. I think that Gins is a not very well shrouded take on Malcolm McLaren and I'll talk more about McLaren in the next video when we do Rock and Roll Swindle and Filth and the Fury but just quickly for those of you who don't know Malcolm McLaren and his partner Vivian Westwood owned the shop Sex in London in in the 70s and Sex was a fashion boutique that trafficked in um, S&M style clothing, leather, rubber, fetish clothing, and also a lot of clothing with queer and gay iconography and imagery. And it was around this boutique that a lot of the, the sort of punk culture in London sprang from. They, Westwood and McLaren, take a lot of credit for it and they deserve a lot of credit, but obviously Steve Jones and, and John Lydon and uh, Susie Sue and Chrissy Hind and, and others were responsible for making the music, but a lot of the kind of fashion sense came out of there and Jordan was hanging around there and Sue the Cat was hanging around there. Chrissy Hind, I think, worked there part-time. Um, and McLaren became the Sex Pistols manager. And as we'll see when we talk about Rock and Roll Swindle and Filth and the Fury, for McLaren, on the one hand, he had this kind of punk um, spirit of like, let's give two fingers to the system and let's take these boys and let's rub them in the face of the British establishment. But also he saw how lucrative that could be. And so there was always this side of this kind of twofold um, or probably more a drive from McLaren. One, you know, to piss off the British establishment, but also to get rich doing so. And, and this is the sort of Gin's character, like McLaren on steroids. It, he says openly, like, you've got great market potential. You're great for commercialization. I'm gonna make a lot of money off you. And the character is very flamboyant. I love when he's on screen because he's funny, he's silly. He, he, he's very sort of queer presenting in a lot of ways. But he's a, he's a hardcore hyper-capitalist at heart. And part of the film's critique is that the destructive side of punk ideology combined with rampant hyper-capitalism 
will lead to fascism. <laughs> this is part of what the punk community at the time didn't like about the film. But the women in particular, Bod, um, gets tied up with the impresario. They get he, he encourages their extremes. He encourages their excesses. And he seems to be supporting them financially throughout so that they have the wherewithal to, I mean, none of them work, <laughs> except for Liv, the artist. None of them seem to have any family ties or in any way have access to, to any kind of money or capital. And yet, and, and London in the 70s would have allowed for squatting and, and much cheaper living than London today would. There's a great article about that that I will um, I'll link in the description. But Ginn seems to be sort of floating them. And so this creates a kind of um, symbiotic relationship where they benefit from his largesse, but then what do they owe him? And this is where the film's kind of critiques come in because the women go from being sort of talk out loud, do what I want, don't care about anybody kind of punkers to murderous revolutionaries to, by the end of the film, fascists um, to want to kill and destroy. And so this is where the sort of film's critique of not maybe not punk's potential, but the potential of a certain type of punk to be dangerous. Our first shots of modern Britain announce a lot of what the film is going to be trying to do in sometimes subtle and sometimes really obvious ways. So we're, we're with Elizabeth and, and Dee and Ariel and they've asked for knowledge. And what Ariel says first after he gets this request, I think is quite interesting. Sweet majesty, pluck up thy heart and be merry for I will reveal to thee the shadow of this time. We're, we're like three minutes into the film and he's describing what we're about to see at the time modern Britain as a shadow of this time, as in Elizabethan England. So already the film is announcing its intentions or its, its kind of approach to modern Britain if it's describing it as a shadow. And then we get this sequence and it's, it's great and disturbing for a lot of reasons. Let's just have a quick look. So already we see these, this is what they're watching on their screen, but we see these punkers, women, beating somebody else up. So this is our, the first announcement of like punk, physical violence, right? We see this lovely sort of graffiti that says postmodern. <laughs> and then we get this shot that I absolutely adore, even as sort of breathtakingly horrifying as it is of the baby carriage on fire. It's, it's just like a beautifully composed shot that's also a dire warning. What does that image mean? How do we sort of confront that image of the baby carriage on fire? Because later we're gonna get mad, as I said, saying like, let's forget about history, but burning the baby carriage seems to also be symbolic of, well, let's also forget about the future. And eventually in the film, we're gonna get one of the characters Bod shouting out, no future, which is also a reference to a Sex Pistols line. So there's a lot of intertextuality in here. There's a lot of multi-textuality. There's a lot of postmodern referencing. They're gonna reference, Emil Nitrate's gonna reference a Rocky Horror Picture Show in just a few minutes when she says, don't dream it, be it. And there you've got Richard O'Brien and Little Nell and so on. So this opening sequence announces a lot of the thematic directions that the film's gonna go in. And, and it's like beautiful and also <laughs> terrifying. 
we get some scenes of amyl nitrate talking about her approach to history and Mad's kind of reaction to it. Then we get this sequence of Bod murdering Queen Elizabeth, as I mentioned. But then we get this sequence that I alluded to earlier in the cafe. And this is again, the film sort of foreshadowing or announcing what's going on because as the waitress um, responds to Mad burning the postcards and so on, the gang decides to assault her and they assault her with a sort of spray bottle of ketchup and it's a very disturbing scene because the film on the one hand is asking you to relate to these protagonists these punkers these young women who are out there they're doing their thing they're being punk but at the same time they're kind of horrific and we can look at mad burning the postcards and having a kind of um you know Anarchist probably isn't the right word, but this sort of like disregard for property, for private property, and so on. Um, you know, a healthy bit of which is probably good. <laughs> um, but then the assault on this woman who kind of just happens to be there, one might argue that she represents the bourgeois class in the way that she um, willingly becomes a wage slave for the capitalists who own the diner, perhaps. Um, but also she's probably just, you know, trying to make rent and feed her kids or something like that. And, and they assault her because of her rejection. But the, it's that line at the end. Remember, I thought you were going to kill Just dress me up. <laughs> this was just a dress rehearsal. Where's this movie going to take us? Things start to get more intense when Krabs brings home Happy Days. Uh, Happy Days is a singer of one of the punk bands we've seen on TV. He's played by Gene October, who was one of the sort of scenesters of the punk era and was in several bands. Um, and she brings him home basically as kind of a fuck toy. And as I mentioned, the others kind of sit around and watch and they're talking to her about him. And she's talking to them um, about him while they're having sex. But Happy Days has a happy day. <laughs> A little too early. Um, he gets off too early and this is an affront to the women. So they kill him. They murder him. Um, it's again, it's another sort of very disturbing scene and I think there's a lot of ways to read this if we want to get into the sort of potential for meaning of <sighs> you know, all kinds of patriarchal stuff that have to do with male selfishness during the sex act and that sort of thing, not sort of thinking of his sex partner as a partner, but just as like a, a fuck, you know, all the things that go with that. But the, the guy is presented as sort of a lovable, lovable doofus, not as a sort of malevolent figure. Maybe there's something in there too. Um, and then they suffocate him with a plastic bag. Um, and the, the, they get this joy out of it. They get this sort of primal joy. And, you know, now we know the dress rehearsals are over. And from here, Bod seems to be concocting a strategy with the impresario, with Ginz's backing, knowledge, collusion, it's not clear, of murderous rampage and she's smart and she's sexy and she's aloof so she's very good at getting the other women to go along with it and eventually they're gonna murder lounge lizard who's a uh, punk singer and they see on TV that they don't like played by Jane County famous sort of punk avant-garde performer singer and so on and that's a that's a very brutal scene and they're going to murder the cops. And so as the film develops, this kind of murderous intent, this dress rehearsal from early on, becomes actualized in increasingly violent and in increasingly kind of distressing ways, all with Ginz's sort of joyful approval. We need to talk about Ginz. Um, he's sort of the main male figure in the film. Uh, Sinks and Angel and Kid are, are important. Uh, but they're kind of like B or even C characters, and I'll come back to them in a minute. But but Ginz is the kind of main sort of male 
presence. And every time Orlando's on, on screen, it's fantastic. There's a couple scenes I think are worth just sort of mentioning. One is we're in Buckingham Palace, which he has purchased. And there is, it seems to be like a recording booth. There's a, there's a pane of glass separating Gins and the people he's talking to from Mad, who's performing with a punk band. And it's a fantastic scene. And Mad's furious anger as she's singing this song while these people are sitting in the sound booth talking is riveting. And I can't show the whole thing, but I'll just show a little bit of it in the ending, which is one of my favorite punk images from the film. I love this sequence for so many reasons. The song sounds great. Her performance, the way she dances, all of it's really good. It's, re it's one of the highlights of the film for me because while she's doing this, she's pointing her all. She's she's pouring that anger that she has throughout the film, that destructive anger into this music. And Gins is sitting there just talking about how he's benefiting from the chaos and the destruction all around him. This chaos and destruction is leading Matt to perform punk music like this, and it's leading the hyper-capitalists to buy up property, benefit from the chaos, and actually to perpetuate the chaos so he can continue to enrich himself. And to me, there's just, there's just so much going on in that scene that for that alone, this film is fantastic. It's, it really, like, it's very layered, it's shot great, both of the performances there are magnificent. It's electrifying to watch. There's another great Gin scene. I mean, every scene he's in is great. Um, when Adamant the Kid performs with his band, The Ants, as they're called in the film, and he's trying to get backing from Gins to be like the next punk thing. And he performs this song about paranoia. And then at the end of it, Gins comes up, approaches him about his potential as a punker. And he says these things. <laughs> You're signed up. Now, what are we going to call you? Scum. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Scum. That's commercial. It's all they deserve. I love that he says <laughs> the band's going to be called Come because it's commercial. That is a direct ribbing of McLaren and calling his band Sex Pistols and, and so on. Um, as I mentioned, there are some really lovely shots and some really lovely uses of color and framing in the film. There's this great sequence where Mad is carving the word love with a knife on the back of Bod's Bod while Emil Nitrate reads from her history. Um, I love the sequence. It's, it's pretty sort of film 101, but it works really well in this film. When they decide they're gonna go kill Lounge Lizard and we get this shot of the switchblade in front of the TV. It's very cool. And there's this great shot when some of the women are leaving for one of their tasks. And the staging, you can tell that Jarman was a production designer. The staging and the use of color in this scene is just really fantastic. And the film has a low budget feel. It's shot on sort of grainy color film. Um, it's clearly shot on location, but you know, and that gives it its punk vibe, but it also is very thoughtfully created and constructed. And, and that's part of the joy of watching it as well. The film builds to a climax where the, the women join with Gins. They go down to Dorset so they can escape to the sort of confines, the protected confines of a grand estate while the chaos they, they've created burns around them. And this, I think, is Jarman's most pointed critique in the film of the negative potential of punk. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up, and I know this video is getting longer than I intended, as they always do, is that when they get to that estate, there's a character there who is very clearly intended to be a surviving Adolf Hitler. And he is part of the entourage of Gins and the women as they watch the rest of the world burn. And this is also very troubling, and it's also part of, I think, Jarman's critique. And 
I wanted to just use this before I kind of give my final thoughts about the film as a way to talk very briefly about Punk's dalliance with uh, Third Reich imagery, iconography, and sometimes ideology because it's uncomfortable. Now, I am not a historian, a sociologist, a, a punk scholar, or uh, even a cultural historian, really. So these are just kind of my thoughts about this. But British punk definitely played around with Nazi iconography. If you just do a Google image search for London punk 1976, you're going to find pictures with swastikas in them. And if you dig a little deeper, you're going to find lyrics that flirt with, if not full on Nazism, at least anti-Semitism in early music of someone like Susie and the Banshees. And, and so this is disturbing. And, and from today's point of view, it's incredibly disturbing. It would have been then too. I'm not going to try to excuse it. I do want to just discuss it a little bit because it relates back to the film. Um, in the 70s, when the punk punkers, I don't even want to call it a movement, were kind of, you know, giving their two fingers to the British establishment, the war was still very much living memory. You know, we're in 1976. We're only 30 years after the war. You know, 30 years ago today was the 90s, Nirvana. Um, so we're that sort of, they were that sort of far removed from the war. And the sense that Britain had saved the world, much like Americans have about America's role in the Second World War, that Winston Churchill was a sort of global savior, that Britain had stopped Hitler and the Nazis and so on, was very much alive and wedded to the same institutions that the punkers were rebelling against. And so taking on or sort of um, playing with Nazi iconography could be read as not so much endorsing Nazi ideology, but just like rubbing it in the face of the establishment. We hate you, we hate the queen, we hate Winston Churchill, and this is how we're gonna show you. But <clears throat> having said all that, it's a very fine line between sort of appropriating the iconography and stepping over into embracing the ideology. And I'm not saying everyone who, who did the former also did the latter. Um, but the film is very aware of that potential. I mean, Jarman knows that the Nazis were not just anti-Semitic, but were also anti-Roma. Orlando is Romani or comes from that community. And, and not just homophobic, but murderously anti-gay, anti-LGBTQ. Um, and so for someone like him, the, the, the flirtation, even with the iconography, has to be dangerous, it has to be read at least as potentially dangerous. So when they end up with hanging out with Hitler in this um, beautiful mansion, this beautiful sort of British estate while the rest of the country burns in chaos, this is a very pointed criticism uh, that Jarman's saying, like this destructive nature of, of punk, which has a lot of excitement, has a lot of potential, like for the revolutionary spirit of it. Also, if, if it's directionless or if it's co-opted by a hyper-capitalistic kind of um, money for its own sake, that way fascism lies. Not everybody in the punk community appreciated this at the time. Um, in particular, and sort of most famously, was Vivian Westwood. And as I've said throughout this video, I'll talk more about Westwood and McLaren in the next video about Sex Pistols. But it's worth mentioning her response for a couple of reasons. Um, the film exhibits nods to Westwood's aesthetic at sex. Inside, uh, on some of the walls, were spray-painted various sort of manifestos, graffiti words. And you see similar things in the, the squat in Jubilee. Also, Westwood had developed a, a sort of a style of 
putting out t-shirts that had um, full text, written, handwritten text, silkscreen text on the t-shirts. And you see examples of this in the film as well, especially near the end when the women go on one of their killing rampages and they wear these jumpsuits with the text written on the back. Um, so I can imagine Westwood sitting there and not only thinking about the film in terms of how it represented punk, but her directly and also probably McLaren directly in the in the character uh, of the impresario. So her having a negative response to it just on the surface, it makes sense. And so she puts out this t-shirt with kind of an open letter to Jarman in which she expresses some of her problems with the film and some of them are fine. She finds it's sort of um, a celebration of the Elizabethan era and this kind of pastoral England which I've talked about problematic and she thinks that the film even though it shows punk isn't really punk and this is something that's worth talking about and I think the film like walks a line here but then she criticizes the film for being Jarman just uh, a gay boy interested in depicting gay boy fantasies. And there is a lot of queerness to the film, including like on screen depictions of gay men um, having sexual relationships. So, I mean, that's there, that's part of the work, but that was supposedly part of, of the scene also. And it's part of what I was saying in my intro video is the sort of inclusiveness of, of punk and was meant to be the inclusiveness of sex, the shop. And so it's, it's disappointing, let's say, that Westwood would, would go there. So she does have some valid critiques, but then she slips in this sort of casual homophobia. And the problem with it beyond the homophobia of it, is that it's wrong. And I think her reading of that is wrong because what Jarman's doing there, I think, is not just exhibiting sort of queer potential of punk spaces or the queer aspects of it. I mean, the film is descriptive and prescriptive at the same time, but it's talking about how those possibilities in the end, just like a lot of the other liberating possibilities of punk, are have the potential to be erased if this capitalistic fascist sort of impetus within punk, which is not all of punk, it's a drive within punk, if that comes to fruition. And this is where the film, I think, in the end, finds its power. And to go back to my question at the beginning, can it depict punk, be punk, and be critical of punk all at the same time? Yes. And in fact, being able to do that is part of what makes it punk cinema and part of what makes it really work. It's, it's a disturbing film at times. It's funny. You know, I don't want it to paint, if you haven't seen it, as like pure like oh, punk horror. There's a lot of funny parts. There's great music. The music's fantastic. It's silly at times. It's sort of avant-garde and weird at times. And it's horrific at times and disturbing. And it, it walks the line between all of those so that this is a great film. It's, it's low budget and it suffers from some of the things that low budget films do. Um, the performances aren't all great. They're all fun, but they're not all great. There's some wooden performance. Um, there's some, you know, <laughs> to today's eyes, let's say, it could use some sort of tighter editing. I don't mean between scenes, but within scenes. You get these moments where like nothing's happening and it doesn't feel like it's not happening because the film wants it to. They just didn't snip those like two seconds here and three seconds, seconds there mm -hmm. out of the film. But that's a small price to pay for this like very provocative, thought provoking, heartfelt, really well made. Like this is a film that's made with intention. Um, that's looking at this revolutionary possibility and saying, let's celebrate this, but also let's ask ourselves, what if? And in that sense, it's a, not just an important film for the way it depicts very accurately 1977 punk London, but the way it challenges it. So it's like, it loves punk, but it's a little bit worried.
And in that sense, it's a really wonderful film. And if you're a punker or into punk at all, you need to check it out. Thanks for watching everybody. This is Movie Talk with Aaron Hunter. I'm Aaron Hunter. If you've made it this far, please hit the like button. Please subscribe to my channel. I've just hit 1500 subscribers, which is not a lot in the scheme of things, but it means a lot to me. So I appreciate every subscription. Share it with your friends. Let me know in the comments, like this is a film that has had like sort of wildly divergent responses. Did I get it all wrong? What do you think about Jarman? What do you think about Jubilee? What do you think about the way he's probing these connections between punk, destruction, fascism, and so on? But whatever you do, please, between now and the next video, between now and tomorrow, between now and for the rest of your life, keep watching movies.